This is on assignment. Hello and welcome to On Assignment, a look at the stories behind the stories. I'm Imran Siddiqui. And I'm Alex Villarreal. In this episode, a VOA reporter just back from Boston gives us her eyewitness account of the aftermath of the marathon bombings. Then it's off to Egypt, where two years after the revolution, women are still not free from fear. In Senegal, a beauty trend with damaging side effects. And the difficulties and dangers of broadcasting and even blogging to Iran. We'll tell you more. Your backstage pass to VOA on assignment is next. The two suspects in the April 15th Boston Marathon bombings were brothers, 26-year-old Tamerlan Tsarnaev and 19-year-old Johar Tsarnaev. Tamerlan died in a shootout with police while Johar was captured later and taken to the hospital with gunshot wounds. Well, joining us right now is Carolyn Pursuti, VOA correspondent who was there on the scene in Boston. Tell us something, what was the first impression when you arrived on the scene? When we first got there, it was Monday night, and it seemed like a ghost town. There was no one out on the street, no cars passing us. Um, and that was because of the fear in the Boston residents, and also because the mayor had told them, stay inside tonight. But along that finish line route that was cordoned off because it was a crime scene, um, there were cups, there were blankets, um, I saw cosmetics on the floor. Um, glasses, uh, eyeglasses, um, just everything was left right where people had stood up and run from the bombing site. So it was as if people were doing something one minute and then they disappeared because everything was left right where they left it. It was an eerie sight to see. Mm. And so seeing that and talking about how eerie it was to be there on the ground where this had just happened only hours before you got there. What is it, what is that like for you as a journalist? You know, you have to reconcile your duties and responsibilities doing your job with your emotions as a citizen. Right, Alex, you're so right. Um, there's almost two sides to a journalist. You have to be professional when you're on the job. But of course, you still have a heart. So you still have that personal side. So I shelved all my emotions while I was doing my job, certainly, and reported things as I saw them, as I was witnessing them, what I heard, what, what I, the people that I interviewed. But then the last day, I went to the memorial, the makeshift memorial that was right on the end of the barricaded area. And the three crosses had just been brought there of the three people that had died. And it was then that it hit me. I, I knew that one was a child, one was the eight-year-old, the other two that, that had died. Just also very young, uh, two right. young women, yeah. Right, and that's when it hit me, and I just, my legs kind of gave out. You know, I kind of stooped down, and I just got in touch with my own feelings then, and teared up, and um, that's when I really understood the magnitude of, of what had happened. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Yeah, really, Carolyn, thank you for sharing your, your insights. Uh, Carolyn Pursuti, again, is a VOA correspondent who reported for us from Boston. Now, we're going to take a break now, but coming up, fighting for women's rights in Egypt. You're watching On Assignment. Women played a major role in the Egyptian revolution two years ago, which brought down the government of Hosni Mubarak. But since then, some activists say violence against women has been on the rise, including disturbing cases of gang rape. I talked about this issue with our Cairo correspondent, Elizabeth Arad. We begin now with a clip of her report from February, which was a particularly difficult month for women in Egypt. Take a look. Mob sexual violence against female protesters has skyrocketed in the past month, with at least 19 attacks reported on Tahrir Square in one day alone. As in this video, the victim is encircled by a group of men. The men rip off the women's clothes and violate them with hands, sticks, and in at least one case, a blade. Women have rallied in protest, demanding the president investigate and bring those responsible to justice. The sexual attacks have been long endemic in Egypt, with many women reporting frequent harassment just going about their lives. Women can find it bewildering. When I go in the street and found something hit me or, or touch my, my, my body, what, what are you, they think about? How they could do that?
is a long history in Egypt of, of sexual harassment on the street. But earlier this year, during the celebrations of the anniversary of the revolution, there was a particularly difficult time where there were these, it seemed, orchestrated rapes and assaults of women in Tahrir Square itself. And people did come forward, and that was a bit unusual. People, there is a stigma attached, and people, especially women's rights groups, are trying to, to lower that stigma and, and have this problem addressed. And what types of assaults are we talking about? Can you give us a little bit of a, a description of what women are facing on a daily basis? Everything from walking down the street and being called names or lewd comments to being touched to being groped and then the, in the worst cases attacked, sometimes you know, taken, taken by taxi drivers and put aside. The ones that made a lot of news in Tahrir, groups of men would single out a woman, encircle her, and then create confusion by saying that they were rescuing them, but then in fact were the people who were, protect, were actually doing the attacking. And it would be rapes with blunt instruments and you know, tearing off their clothes and, and various forms of sexual assault. They were quite graphic and quite, quite disturbing. In post-revolution Egypt, the number of women reporting sexual harassment and violence has skyrocketed. So too, it appears, has the tendency to blame women for the assaults against them. What else does she expect when she walks down the street with tight, revealing clothes in a provocative way? What else can these men do? I don't want to say it's a natural response, but they're not entirely to be blamed. How pervasive is this viewpoint? Women do get blamed. They get blamed by their family for, for bringing on such, such attention to themselves. And it's part of a patriarchal as well as a conservative religious background. There are people speaking up against it, and again, in this man himself, people have, have criticized him, the government criticized him. So there is a little bit more public awareness, not a lot, but it's beginning. And how widespread is this problem uh, across the Arab world? Is this just an Egyptian problem, or is this uh, an Arab world issue? Well, I must say from my travels, I've never seen it anywhere as bad as here, and I've heard that from other journalists who cover situations in, throughout the region. Egypt does have a reputation, and it isn't clear where it com com comes from. You talk about the dangers that face uh, Egyptian women, but also we've seen um, journalists, foreign journalists, uh, face attacks as well. You yourself, as a woman journalist, do you have any fear? Well, it's oddly, the one time that, that I was groped, and it was by the police, but it was under Mubarak's era. It was, it was before the revolution, and it was, you know, young, young riot police, and that was just what they did, and there was nothing, you know, I tried to talk to them about it, and, and they just thought it was all very funny. Um, it is difficult. Uh, you, you have to be aware. You try and go in with other people and, and make sure that you have people looking out all around because it's, it's, it's a very, it can be a very difficult situation. What do you think can be done to stop it? It would be very nice, I think, and this is what a lot of the human rights and women's rights groups would like, is to see this made a priority of the Egyptian government. Mr. Morsi did come up with an initiative about of women and what women's issues and women's rights. And he said that you know, addressing sexual harassment was a top priority, but in terms of concrete action, the entire concrete action was to hold a workshop for one day. So people are really expecting more and more serious uh, ways of addressing this, this problem. VOA Cairo correspondent Elizabeth Arrett. Violence against women is, of course, a worldwide problem with many different motives. Now, in Egypt, activists say sexual assaults are often politically motivated, intended to intimidate women against advocating for change. We're taking a break now. When we come back, another issue for women in Africa. You're watching on Assignment. The World Health Organization says a quarter of women in Senegal use skin lightening products regularly. The products can contain mercury or caustic agents like sodium hydroxide. These dangerous ingredients can be disfiguring and even cause cancer. But as VOA's Anne Look told me, some women in the capital, Dakar, say the risks are simply the price of beauty. So Anne, this skin lightening trend that you reported on out of Senegal. How common is this? 
It's really common um, in Senegal and throughout the region, throughout the continent, really. For, for a while there, people didn't really understand the health impacts, you know, what serious health consequences these these creams, these soaps can, can pose. But that lately, for example, in Senegal, there's been a lot of public education. You know, pe- women are starting to realize how dangerous these products are, but they continue to use them. And that's what I found so interesting for the story was to kind of talk to women about why do they keep doing it. Women in Senegal say they lighten their skin for the same reasons women the world over say they tweeze, squeeze or otherwise alter their bodies in sometimes dangerous ways to achieve a certain standard of beauty, to catch a husband, to stand out in the crowd, to smooth out imperfections, to get ready for a special event. You know, the, the worst offenders, the women who really engage in some of the most dramatic skin lightening, you know, are village women who come and move to the city and kind of want to look big city, want to look more successful, want to look more in, more on trend, etc. And then the other thing is that it represents a certain level of success. I mean, these products are expensive. A typical beauty supply shop in Dakar, complete with a selection of skin lightening creams and soaps. This lotion, it is carrot based. It will make you an amazing color. Shop clerk Adama Jane says she uses a similar cream and she tells clients to avoid the stronger ones that promise fast, dramatic results. It is a personal choice. No one pressures me. Some women want to be black every day, but I prefer to be a shade of brown. It's better for me. I like it. You mentioned some of these negative health effects that we've seen from these lightning creams. What are some of the dangers? The creams are so strong. I mean, something like hydroquinone, you know, they're they're carcinogenic. I mean, they can cause cancer in and of themselves, but the chemicals in the products. Women complain that products like this can sting their eyes or burn their skin. The harsh chemicals can weaken the tissue, leading to stretch marks and infections. But still, they don't stop. Senegalese filmmaker Hariata Puisal was so troubled by the trend, in particular among prominent female public figures in the media, that last year she made her international award-winning documentary, This Color That Bothers Me. It aired nearly a dozen times on state television in Senegal. I used the most shocking images so that women would know what they are exposing themselves to. Many of them know the dangers but don't think it will happen to them. It is hard to understand why a woman would tell herself that dark skin is not beautiful. It's in their heads. They want to please a man, to be loved or they want to please society to succeed. One interesting thing that um, women told me is that, you know, in some ways it's an illusion because a lot of these prominent women, you know, you'll see politicians, singers, models that you see on television and music videos, et cetera, that have this just, it looks almost like ashen white skin. I mean, it's so like just pale and kind of even, but that's all, that that's makeup. And that when you see these women in person, and I've, I've seen it myself in Dakar, th- their skin is actually very splotchy and dry. And, you know, it's, it's not nearly what, what's being presented, for example, on television. So, Anne, in going out and reporting on this issue, um, how willing were women to talk to you about this? Women were were terrified to go on camera talking about it because I don't know if it's that they have perhaps internalized or, or realized that it's a bit taboo or it's a bit dangerous or it's bad for them, you know, and they're kind of don't don't want to fess up to actually doing it. One woman did do an interview. She was a, a, a young um, woman, probably about my age, about 30, who her skin was, was very damaged and very pale. And we did the interview and she called me almost in tears later and begged me not to use it because she was so afraid that, you know, her, her fiance might see it. Women are still fairly conflicted about doing it, even if, even if they do it. All right, and again, that was Anne Look, who covers West Africa for VOA from Senegal. Now, Anne says women using these creams say they are not trying to become white, but instead just want their skin to be a lighter shade. Turning now to a new offering on VOANews.com, the Inside Iran blog, written by Nigar Mortazavi and Arash Karimi. They have tackled many important issues facing Iran, such as corruption, politics, press freedom, and the death of a popular Iranian actress. Now, I sat down with Nagar and Arash for more on their blog and how they cover their homeland for an audience outside looking in. 
I think covering Iran right now is a little bit difficult and tricky or challenging, let's say. You have to be very creative, specifically for us working for a U.S.-funded Persian media outside the country. There's a lot of sensitivity. We can't go to the country. We can't report from the field. So it's hard to get material, and I think social media is sort of filling a void that is that distance, that physical distance, and there's a lot of creative ways that the people, the citizens themselves, are aware of and are using social media to sort of disseminate this information and for us on this end to try to pick up that information. We have a lot of activity on social media whether it's Facebook or Twitter and we kind of see stories that never get picked up. We thought we could show a different side of Iran that's rarely discussed. Recently there's an actress that died. There's a huge social media reaction to it. There's a lot of responses to it. So we kind of try to capture that. working out of the United States but covering Iranian issues and broadcasting inside Iran, primarily in Farsi. Um, what kinds of personal experiences have you faced? Me, I'm always personally torn because our blog is in English, so I always ask myself, what are we doing and what is it serving? So a lot of the times it, you want to get information out to people. And the thing is, like, who are we sending the information out to? Who's our audience? So you, you want to be careful. You don't want to just... Uh, pick up something and beat it to death and say, oh, look how bad they are, look how horrible it is. Because we aren't discussed, we aren't talking to a local population. We're talking to people that are interested in Iran. So I'm always conscious of giving them the whole picture and trying to give them a whole perspective of what it is. We picked a name for the blog Inside Iran, meaning trying to bring what's inside Iran to outside of Iran, to the audience, the non-Iranian audience. And an example would be our latest post about the earthquake, right, about 40 people can, died, yeah. a thousand people were injured, a hundred of them were in critical conditions as we right. wrote, 700 houses were destroyed. But we figured, we were just uh, looking through conventional media, let's say, what everybody had picked up on was that this earthquake happened next to a nuclear site where one of Iran's nuclear reactors are, which, um, I mean, not that that's not part of the story, but that's what causes the attention, that's what becomes the headline. So you're trying to bring, actually, the, the ground level exactly. information. And you yourself, Nagar, you had a personal experience being a, a journalist working for the Voice of America with your family in Iran. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. I mean, working for VOA Persian, and this is this, the case with other foreign-based Persian media, VOA Persian, BBC Persian, Radio Farda, which is our sister organization, there's a lot of sensitivity on the journalists, people who do content, and on-air personalities. That's why some of our colleagues don't even use their own names. So recently, my family had been pressured. The security forces came to our house. They searched our house, took the electronics. My parents have been to, my father specifically has been to interrogations, and the demand is that I stop working for the Persian media. There's not much sensitivity on English coverage of Iran news, but on Persian there is. And how has that affected that experience? How has that affected your commitment to your work? I mean, it's very emotional and it's a tough decision, which I kind of made this decision way back when I started working, decided to start working for VOA Persian and use my own name, my own identity, and be on air with my own face and everything. But uh, it's a constant challenge. Sometimes you just think whether it's worth it or not and the price that you're paying might be so high. So Imran, I think it's really important to take note of what Nagar was just talking about and in, in the dangers that yeah. a lot of journalists face reporting from all over the world, really. And I know in Pakistan specifically, there have been a lot of cases of journalists being targeted. Absolutely. As you know, uh, CPJ, uh, Community to Protect, Protect Journalists, said that it's one of the most volatile regions in the world for journalists. And in fact, VOA has lost a correspondent uh, in the recent months. So it is pretty tough. Absolutely. Well, if you want to find out more about uh, Nagar and Arash's blog, you will find it at the VOANews.com homepage in the blog section. And again, it's called Inside Iran. Moving on, Detroit, Michigan, known as the Motor City, home to the big three U.S. automakers, is now in economic decline after a slow mass exodus of the city's population. Those who moved away left behind homes and buildings that have succumbed to fire, vandalism, and neglect tarnishing Detroit's global image. But as VOA's Kane Faribar reports, one man is leading an effort to clean up his hometown one block at a time. Let's roll that. If one man's trash is another man's treasure, then the Brightmore neighborhood of Detroit is John George's gold mine. I look at Detroit, I guess through um, 
rose-colored glasses. You know, I've been here all my life. Um, you know, we were the city that put the world on wheels. Uh, we were the arsenal of democracy uh, to help win World War II. Um, we taught, you know, the world to dance with Motown. Um, so I have such a deep respect and love for the city. And I think a lot of people uh, do as well. I just don't think they realize how far we've fallen. John George doesn't see broken windows and burned out homes. He sees memories. This is where he raised his children when each house along these streets was occupied. George says people started leaving in the wake of Detroit's deadly riots in 1967, and the exodus has not stopped. I mean, you can blame it on everything from the riots to the oil embargo to racism to suburban sprawl. There's so many reasons why. Um, I really don't think at this point it really matters um, why. I think the, the question is now what? Now, George's neighborhood is at the beginning of a revival, thanks to his organization of volunteers to change the circumstances. Blight is like a cancer. If you don't nip it in the bud, it spreads and it kills everything. George's Motor City Blightbusters tears down, or secures, the worst of the blighted structures in the Brightmore neighborhood. One board, one brick, one house at a time. Last weekend, uh, there were youth actually playing on that top porch. So today, um, because of uh, the condition of this property, uh, it's a bit of an emergency. Uh, we're going to remove the porch and start boarding up the property. Nice to walk, go. In 25 years, George has raised or fixed dozens of structures, replacing areas of devastation and crime with green space. That's that long chain. You could wrap it around all Through it all, it he has refused point. to give up or leave. The people who are left in Detroit are the diehards. John George is Detroiter number one. So I couldn't imagine a, John, a, a city of Detroit without a John George. Brightmore Alliance Executive Director Kirk Mays says people are slowly returning because of George's efforts. Somebody who's got a mission like his, somebody's got the heart that he has, somebody that has the drive that he has for the things that he does, um, the rare thing is that he gets the attention. Detroit business leaders have taken notice of Blightbusters. A newly formed nonprofit Detroit Blight Authority seeks donations to fund an ambitious goal of raising about 13,000 structures per year at a pace that could eliminate Detroit's blight completely in five years. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Detroit, Michigan. And that's our show for this week, but before we go, we would like to tell you that you can watch On Assignment on YouTube with captions now in English and many other languages. All you have to do is click on CC in the player window and adjust your view and settings. You can either click English or translate captions to see it in another language. It is just that simple. Thank you so much for watching us. On behalf of On Assignment, see you next time.